Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Wayne's World of Science and Technology. Today, I want to talk a little bit about the 2022 Russian full-scale invasion of Ukraine. This is an early, early evaluation by me. When I say early, let's face it, the war isn't over. It's not going to be over for a while, but this is based on what I've seen, what I think has happened. Now, I'm quite willing to change my mind about my opinions on this if you guys can come up with different things that make sense. But, you know, this is based on the information I personally have seen. So, um, let's face it, right now there's a lot of stuff that those of us who aren't on the battlefield just don't know. And there's going to be stuff that isn't going to be let loose until after the war. Um, I have no doubt that Ukraine and Russia are both going to sit on the work done by their secret, uh, their security agencies for a long time after this. And that's normal. So, you know, basically saying we don't know, hey, we, we really don't have any idea. Um, anyways, the first thing I became aware that stuff was heating up in Ukraine was in October of 2021. Um, this is not to do with the announcement that Russian troops were moving. It was actually due with the announcement of the uh, first use of a Bayraktar TB2 drone in combat in Ukraine and the amount of whining and moaning the Russians did about it. Now, the Bayraktar TB2... It's an effective machine, yeah, but it's not that effective. So why were they screaming so much? You know, when somebody starts whining about escalation, I tend to look at their previous record, and every time Russia's screamed about escalation, it's always been because their vict current victim has had the complete and utter gall to fight back. And... Okay, so Ukraine was using the drone to fight back against the separatists. Who, by that point, I have to admit, I was pretty certain were actually fully Russian back. But, you know, again, I wasn't actually paying a lot of attention. At this point, my attention was mostly focused on China. And um, the other thing is, I knew how bad a shape the Russian military was in. And when I say I knew... Peter Zion has said that he thinks that as much as a third of the Russian military budget may be going to corruption. I'm almost certain he's wrong. Um, I have no doubt on the top, top end, yeah, the huge chunks are getting peeled off by the top end folks. But the corruption goes all the way down through. And I have a suspicion that a lot more than a third was going missing. And the Russian military budget just wasn't large enough to have the amount of equipment and manpower they'd need to pull something as large as taking on Ukraine. And when we say as large as taking on Ukraine, a uh, general rule of thumb is 1 in 17 uh, troops to hold a territory after you've conquered it. Okay, let's say it's 1 in 20. Ukraine had 40 million population. That meant Russia needed 2 million troops to uh, hold the place. And they were going in with 250,000, 300,000, something like that. I don't know what the exact number is. I've heard as low as 190,000. I don't think it was that low, but that's based, again, on anecdotal evidence. I'm not 100% certain. So, we're... <clears throat> Where did I, sorry, I lost myself here. The Russian Federation was not in shape to do anything. I could see that. Now, China taking on Taiwan, that's a totally different kettle of fish. Yeah, you have to take a boat to get to Taiwan, but the sheer number of people in mainland China as compared to the number of people in Taiwan, it's just no comparison at all and the Russian Federation had a population which 
depending upon which source you were paying attention to, was between 136 and 146 million in 2022, as compared to Ukraine's 44 to 46 million. And you know, it just was not physically possible. So I basically assumed that the Russians knew it was impossible too. Oh boy, that was a big mistake, and I caught hell for that, believe me. Um, I told my ex-wife that there's no way that Putin would move, and in the morning she basically said, Hey, you were wrong, and oops, egg on FaceTime. Yeah. So, um, I got a big surprise. Russia had plans for Ukraine. Um, Russia appears to view itself as the successor state of the Soviet Union, the Imperial Russian, uh, Imperial Russia, the uh, Cuban Rus before that, and uh, how should I put it, just about everybody on the planet. They think that they have ownership over everything, um, which is not really surprising. Again, I grew up in Canada. Um, we have a Russian bear bomber showing up off our north coast almost weekly. Uh, so, yeah, we are not necessarily fans of the Russians. And um, I said, you know, basically, it's all about the money. They weren't spending the money to do it. Okay, so they went ahead and did it. What happened? This is where things get really fun. The uh, United States and the United Kingdom had been warning everybody that they were intending to do it. I thought they were a little bit overstating the fact. Obviously, I was totally wrong on that. And they went ahead and did it. Uh, I, whether because of the warnings, whether because of stuff that the uh, GRU and Ukraine had found out on their own, or whatever, I'm not exactly certain. But uh, on the uh, morning of February 24th, when the Russian rockets started landing on uh, Ukrainian air defense locations and airfields, the air defense unit assets had been moved, and so had the planes. So Ukraine didn't lose very much during the initial attack. This gave them the ability to basically choke the Russians at uh, Hostomel Airport and uh, snuff them out. Because the Russian unit at Hostomel Airport was snuffed, they had to divert uh, transports, which were full of paratroopers, and the Russians did, and this uh, basically left them in a situation where their only option was to drive south to Kiev, which they tried to do. Basically, in the north, I don't think they had much local support. Now, in the south, I think they'd managed to buy their way in. You look at how easily they got in from Crimea into um, Zaporizhia, and there's just no way that should have been possible. There were apparently bridges that were supposed to be set to blow, which had been, had the charges removed. And it's like there was somebody, several somebodies, plotting directly to make sure that Ukraine could not win. So that's how the Russians got so far in the south. If they hadn't been able to get out of Crimea, it could have been pretty well stomped uh, right then and there. Because in the north, they were running into problems. Now, I know everybody around me was going all gaga about the... Uh, big Russian column heading toward Kiev. My reaction was a little bit different. I took a look at it and said, target practice. Because that's what it was. There were so many vehicles so close together, you couldn't miss. 
and it left the Russians incredibly vulnerable. Ukraine got smart. They didn't use their anti-tank weapons on the tanks. They used it on the fuel trucks. So the tanks ran out of fuel. And a lot of Russian soldiers had to walk back to Belarus. Some got rides, but a lot ended up walking back. The other offensive in the north also got pushed back. It took a bit longer, but basically Ukraine was fighting and they were willing to push hard and they did one hell of a job. And they also captured one hell of a pile of equipment. Um, fixing up the uh, mess in the south, well, that was another matter. Now, at this point when we have the north pretty well fixed and the Russians are at their maximum effort in the south, Ukraine changed the game. Ukraine had basically been, um, since the start of the war, under blockade. Nobody could get ships in or out of the uh, Black Sea coast. Ukraine, with their new missiles, took out the Russian cruiser Moskva, which should not have been vulnerable to those missiles, but that's another point that we'll probably never know the answer to is exactly why. But anyway, Ukraine managed to get those missiles through. They hit the ship. The ship sunk. This meant that the Russians no longer had a ship with decent anti-air uh, defenses that they could park near the coast to keep uh, cargo ships from going in and out of Ukraine. The next thing the Ukrainians did was they took back Snake Island. Uh, that was done by some rather fun work with a really long-range howitzer. Uh, they basically pounded the Russians, and the Russians had nothing to uh, fight back with. And uh, in trying to hold Snake Island, the Russians lost a lot of stuff. And uh, I mean a lot of stuff. It was pretty amazing watching the stuff that happened down there. By taking back Snake Island, the Ukrainians opened up a transit hub for their grain products. Now, a lot of people are going to say, okay, what's this got to do with the war? Wars are common in two types. There's the short victorious war, which is basically what would happen if you were to, say, take the nation state of Italy they were to order their military to conquer Vatican City. It would be over fast. I mean, the Italian military has air power, sea power, land power. The Vatican has the Swiss Guard. And I don't care how brave the Swiss Guard are, they wouldn't stand a chance. That's a short, victorious war. Any other war turns into an endurance contest. And... When this turned into an endurance contest, in other words, when Russia didn't win within the first month or so, the ability of Ukraine to ship product out and get money back in became crucial. This kept the Ukrainian state alive. Yes, they got a lot of resources from their partners, but this made a huge difference. And... Um, that actually was the next phase. The next phase was the sea warfare phase. And the sea warfare phase continued. Ukraine started using their drone boats to chase Russian ships all over the Black Sea. And they eventually managed to push most of the Russian Navy out of uh, Sevastopol to either Novorossiysk or into the Sea of Azov. And this has basically crippled Russian naval operations, which included using the uh, Russian Black Sea Fleet to toss missiles at Ukraine. Uh, the Russian Black Sea Fleet has to travel further now to be able to toss the missiles. This puts more wear and tear on the ships, and it's basically, oh, how should I put it? Death, of, death by a thousand cuts. It had a one extra cut the uh, extra distance that the Russians had to move, never mind having to dodge every time that they turned around and saw something that looked like it was a drone boat floating towards them. The uh, hitting of the uh, Crimean Bridge later also uh, helped considerably. This blocked 
Russia's ability to transport heavy cargo loads over the rail portion of the bridge. And that started to starve Crimea a little bit. Now I say a little bit. Russia, at this point, turned around and said, okay, we've got our landing ships. We'll start shipping stuff over in our landing ships and we'll use the ferries, which is what they were doing. Uh, Ukraine, of course, started targeting the ferries with drone, the uh, landing ships with drone boats, and then later targeted the ferries with missiles. Basically, what Ukraine was doing was strangling Russia's, supply, uh, strangling Russia's ability to, to supply Crimea and thus Zaporizhia and uh, the uh, part of Kherson Oblast that they hold. Also, Ukraine was pushing really hard in Kherson, and this caused the Russians to move a lot of troops there, at which point the Ukrainians went on the offensive in Kharkiv, and while well, we all know about that wonderful thunder run, which called all the way to the Osco River and passed. It was uh, quite impressive. And then they finished their offensive in Kherson by taking back the uh, left bank. And sorry, folks, in, in Ukraine, the um, left bank of the Dnipro is the west bank. The right bank is the east bank. That uh, says you're facing south from uh, Kiev. So, anyway, um, that pretty well settled things for a while. And then in the next year, Ukraine tried to go on the offensive in the south. Unfortunately, the amount of time that they had to take to get the equipment needed to actually start the offensive meant that the Russians had built up huge lines of uh, mines and fortifications, and the offensive basically didn't go very far. Um, they did manage to chop a hole in the Russian lines, which is still there, but it hasn't expanded. The next thing that happened was the Russians started pushing really, really heavily. And this is, uh, well, we saw, okay, Sidverdinesk, there's a chance, Bakhmut, um, Adi, I can't remember the last name of the sound. Anyways, the point is, they've been pushing really hard. Now, at this point, you're, I'm going to have to go on a limb here because I cannot prove what I'm, going to, what I'm saying. But I'm almost 100% certain the Russians are taking a lot more casualties than the Ukrainians are. And that the Russians are taking these casualties in inefficient ways. They're losing people they don't need to lose because they don't appear to have the, the uh, training. If these people had six months worth of training, they'd be efficient. With one month worth of training, they just don't know enough. And some of them appear to have less than a month of training. So it's really, I'm really 100% certain that Russians are taking huge casualties. Now, how many casualties? I don't know. The Ukrainian numbers might be right. They might be wrong. I couldn't tell you. I can tell you that the Russian numbers are 100% wrong because, well, let me see, they shot down the Ukrainian Air Force three times, or is it four times already? Over. Think about that. So, the next phase of the uh, battle, or the war, moved on to what I'm going to call the Ukrainian Strategic Bombing Campaign. Russia had been tossing missiles at Ukraine for ages, basically trying to hit the power grid, and they had done a fairly decent job of disturbing things. Ukraine started hitting other targets, uh, ammunition factories, uh, factories that make uh, materials used in camouflage, all sorts of interesting places. Uh, distilleries, or I say distilleries, both alcohol distilleries and oil distillation plants. They've been hitting a lot of stuff, and these hits have been, I think, a lot more significant than people realize. Um, Russia has, 
a lot of resources in some ways and limited resources in others. Part of Russia's problem is the fact that Russia is so damn big. It doesn't matter how many resources you have in Siberia if you need them in the Urals. And that's basically part of the problem Russia's having right now. They cannot bring their strength to bear. Uh, they, need to re they need to retain their Baltic fleet. They need to retain their northern fleet. They need to retain their eastern fleet. Uh, the Black Sea fleet, well, it's not really much use right now. And the Caspian flotilla, well, last I heard they scattered after a couple of uh, missiles landed on them. So, yeah, um, they've got a lot of stuff they can't use. And it's basically the same with everything else. If they have fighter jets in Kamchatka, those fighter jets can't be in Ukraine. And they can't just move all the fighter jets from Kamchatka. They don't know what the United States might do. Or Japan, or Canada, or for that matter, even their No Limits partner, China who, if they trust China, they're bloody crazy in my opinion, but anyway. Um, so, Russia's suffering hugely on this point. Ukraine, on the other hand, is a relatively tiny country, and I know I'm going to get a lot of pushback from people on that, but look, I live in a country that has five provinces that are bigger than Ukraine. Ukraine is a tiny place from my point of view. And as a result, the Ukrainians aren't quite in the same situation. A fighter jet that's uh, based near Kiev can cover the front lines. Or one that's covered in, based near um, uh, Zaporizhia or Chernihiv. You There's all sorts of places that you can work from in Ukraine and get to the front lines relatively quickly with your air assets which means Ukraine doesn't need as many air assets to cover the area. They don't need as much anti-aircraft to cover the area, which is why we're not seeing any Russian planes over Ukraine. They just couldn't get there. It wasn't safe. They would have died and it would have gained Russia nothing, so Russia held them back. Uh, it's also why you're not seeing any Ukrainian jets over Russian positions. The Ukrainians don't want to lose their jets either. So, the strategic bombing campaign is starting to have a huge impact because it's hitting a lot of places where it's um, impacting on Russia's ability to repair existing equipment. And when I say repair existing equipment, you're going to say, why? Well, everything needs maintenance. The more you use it, the more maintenance it needs. When you lose out on your um, ability to produce uh, certain types of distillate doils, which will be turned into uh, grease later for use, uh, use on um, a tank, you lose your ability to grease that tank and every other tank out there. So Ukraine's strikes have been, from what I can tell, and again, this is basically me looking at stuff I'm seeing uh, from the ISW and from... Uh, all the videos that get posted to Twitter and Blue Sky and Reddit and stuff like that, it looks like they are targeting certain specific key industries and they're avoiding everything else. In other words, they're not trying to take out railroad tracks. They might try to take out a railroad bridge, but they're not going to ta try to take out railroad tracks. Railroad tracks are too easy to repair. Instead, what they're going to do is they're going to aim for the factory that makes the railroad tracks. Now that is a useful target. Or, well, in this case, they're probably not going to aim for that factory because that's a relatively low-tech factory, but they'd be aiming for factories that actually have a direct impact on the war itself. So, as I said, the oil distillation plants, the plants that they're hitting are probably ones that are supplying war materials. Almost all of them would be supplying war materials. The um, alcohol, again, that's used in war materials. The optics plants they hit, optics are used in war materials. The missile plant they hit, missiles are used, well, they are war materials. So, 
they're slowly trying to strangle Russia's ability to produce this stuff. Are they succeeding? I have no idea. I think they're having an impact, but I don't know that they're succeeding. If Russia was to surrender, that would be a solid proof they'd succeeded. But I don't see Russia surrendering, do you? No, but what I thought. The next point is that uh, then, of course, Ukraine did these nice little move into uh, Kursk, which I wasn't expecting. It was quite inventive and uh, quite uh, illuminating. I didn't know that Russia had that little defense on that part of their front line. Well, I guess we know now. I guess the Russians know that they need a little bit more defense there, which means that those are soldiers that they'll have to pull from somewhere else. And no, they're not going to be pulling them from the front line because what they'll be doing is they'll be moving conscript troops around. Probably. At least that's what I think they're going to be doing. Um, but there is a fair bit of very solid evidence that Russia is trying to recruit everybody that they can. And when I say everybody that they can, there's recruiting in Nepal, China, um, Cuba... Belarus, basically every state that Russia has any so any semi semblance of friendship with, Russia has been trying to recruit in. And some of these countries have basically turned around and said to Russia, "Hey, stop that." Some of them have said, "Uh, folks, whatever you do, don't go." But they haven't actually told Russia to stop it. This tends to indicate a bit of desperation. You don't go that far afield looking for mercenaries unless you need them. Okay, conclusion. This war is not over. It's not going to be over... My guess is if it's over in six months, we'd be lucky. It could quite well drag on for close to another year or maybe even longer than that. I mean, look at the Korean War. It's still dragging on. So, I can't tell you exactly where things are going to go. I can tell you that while both sides have suffered grievously and both sides are having huge problems with manning, that Ukraine is technologically in a far better shape than they were two years ago, two and a half years ago. At the time of the initial invasion, I thought that Ukraine actually had a marginal technical advantage because of the drones. And when I say marginal technical advantage, there's usable technology and there's technology. The SU-57 is not usable technology for a sergeant and a frontline platoon. He can't call in an airstrike with it. He can call in an airstrike from a TB-2. There's a difference. And... That's where I thought Ukraine had a huge advantage, well, a small advantage at the start, but it was huge in the way it played out. The stuff that they did have that was high-tech was really good. There wasn't enough of it, nowhere near enough of it, but what there was worked, and it worked well, and it proved itself on the field of battle. I'm talking the Enlaws, I'm talking the Javelins, all sorts of nice little toys like that and they've got more of them now but the battle's changed it's not close up now it's an artillery battle and it's an air battle you know the strategic bombing campaigns the uh, dueling strategic bombing campaigns so it's going to come down to whether or not the West gets Ukraine the artillery it needs to be able to push Russia out. And it is going to come down to artillery. Yes, we can. We could actually give them a... You know, say, 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 say we dug a thousand F-16s out of storage from somewhere magically and magically gave them all pilots. It would be useful, yeah, but you'd lose a lot of pilots. What you need is some way to push the Russians back without getting directly into hand-to-hand -hand range. You want to hit them at range. And that's where HIMARS, the M270s, the MARS, 
all the other MLRSs, all of the long range uh, howitzers, the Excalibur cells, which I know Russia has learned how to jam, but I'm assuming that there's a fix in for the Excalibur by now because it's been long enough. There's fixes in for the other uh, systems which have proven possible to jam. Uh, I don't know how fast all of them are going to be implemented. I know they are being implemented because I've seen reports where people have been talking about it. You know, this is publicly talked about stuff on the internet. In other words, it's nothing from, nothing top secret. It's things that, you know, there's contracts let people read the contract and say, oh, okay, now we have an idea what's going on. So, yeah. Ukraine's in a lot better shape, but, and here's the but, Russia isn't stopping. And the only way that Ukraine can stop Russia is if we give them those extra long-range weapons they need, the extra howitzers, the extra gimlers, and, <clears throat> sorry, can't remember the name of the uh, attackums rounds. We need to flood them with that stuff. And that'll give them the ability that they need to push Russia out. Anyways, that's where I'm sitting at the moment. My basic conclusion is that they can do it, but they need more support. I'm curious. Normally, I don't generally ask for what people think, but this is very much an opinion piece as compared to a fact piece. So, yes, I am very curious as to what you think. You know, the facts say one thing. And you try and, <laughs> if you try and tell me that an apple is orange, yeah, I'm not likely to believe you. Uh, on the other hand, if you disagree with me about the exact state of the uh, situation in Ukraine, well, I can't really 100% prove my uh, thesis, so go ahead and toss yours at me. I'll listen to it too. Anyway, have a good day, folks, and I'll talk to you later.